Welcome to the 2020 ACLS webinar series. The Association of Consultants for Liturgical Space is a voluntary membership organization of professionals dedicated to the creation of beautiful worship spaces for faith communities. This webinar series is part of our commitment to providing mutual professional support and continuing education for our members. I'm Paul Barabo of Growth Design Group. I am the webinar facilitator for the ACLS webinar committee, and it's my pleasure to facilitate today's webinar. Our speaker today is Heather Craig. Heather is serving her 21st year as the archivist for the Basilica of St. Mary in Minneapolis, Minnesota. The bountiful archival collection contains doc documents and ephemera from the parish founding in 1868 up through the church's response to the pandemic. Heather holds a BA in English from Grinnell College and a master's in library and information science from Dominican University. So it's my great pleasure to be able to welcome to our webinar series, Heather Craig. Welcome, Heather. Thank you, Paul. Um, it's really good to be here, and thanks to everybody for attending. Um, and I hope I can give you some good information, keep it interesting, and hopefully not weigh you down too much with archival heaviness here. So um, my mission as the archivist is to collect, catalog, preserve, and document the historical collections of the Basilica our predecessor parish, the Church of the Immaculate Conception, and the larger Catholic community of Minneapolis. So I um, thought I'd add on a little bit to Paul's very kind introduction. Um, here at the Basilica, we're lucky to have a very rich collection, which goes back to 1868. Um, we have sacramental records, school records, announcement books, photographs, vestments, drawings, audio and visual recordings. It's a real mishmash, kind of a combination uh, museum and archival collection. We were fortunate to have um, from 1921 to 1963, a pastor who was also a historian. His name was Monsignor James Rudin. And in addition to writing a history of the Archdiocese of St. Paul in Minneapolis and the Basilica and a number of biographies, um, he also kept the records of everything that happened under his watch, which included the interior finish of the church. Um, after he died in 1963, between Vatican II and an inclination, I think, to let go of the past and move into the forward, into the future, and also a freeway being built through the middle of our parish. Um, the archival collection is a little scant. We don't have a lot of records from that time. Um, up through the 19, early 1980s, the parish went into a bit of a decline. And then we had um, a resurgence thanks to some forward looking priests and their liturgists. Um, Father Michael O'Connell, had a 125th anniversary of the parish celebration in 1991, 1992, um, that involved a costumed march with a covered wagon from the Riverside um, site of the original Immaculate Conception Church all the way through downtown Minneapolis to the Basilica. And that celebration also included the first archival exhibit, uh, which was put together by volunteers there were a few other volunteers who worked on the archive collection until I was hired. And I inherited a basement room here in the rectory with um, mold on the walls and asbestos pipes below the ceiling and a collection of everything you can imagine stored everywhere you can imagine in the church basement, in the attic, in closets, and in my archives room. Um, we were able to move to a better room temporarily and then a few years ago um, with the support of the Friends of the Basilica, later the Basilica Landmark, um, we refinished 
the rectory fourth floor into a space that um, you're going to see shortly. In terms of users, um, I use the archives all the time um, for uh, magazine articles. I write one for our biannual Basilica magazine. I'm starting to do bi-monthly videos on Facebook highlighting an object in the archives. And we do exhibits. Um, we have cases in the church which get rotated out every two months. And we've also done larger exhibits of our archival material and stories um, down in the undercroft of the church and our gallery space. Our development office and other staff also use the archives to answer simple questions or more complex inquiries. And we also have outside researchers, um, Alan Lathrop, who's a historian, uh, was writing a biography of our enigmatic architect, Emmanuel Masqueray. He came and spent quite a bit of time here. And I also had a grad student, um, among others, who was looking into the temperance movement in the late 19th century. And we have one artifact from that time about the Father Matthew Total Abstinence Society. Uh, we were a very Irish parish, and it's a list of very Irish names, gentlemen, and checked off each meeting that they attended with every once in a while a very sad note that says, broke their pledge. Um, and so for me, this is an artifact that's old and fragile and um, a piece of our history from a time when we really don't have a lot of real tangible objects. Um, but this researcher spent hours looking through it and all the names and he found a lot of value in that object and the information that was in it that I didn't realize was there. And I think that's one of the strengths of the Basilica Archives is that we can provide um, that kind of information. So rather than give you a verbal description of our beautiful space um, for our archives and our art collection here at the Basilica, I'm going to share uh, an excellent overview video that Dr. Johan van Paris put together um, from his Art That Surrounds Us series. So let's, hopefully we can make this work okay. And here you go. Take it away, Dr. van Paris. Hello oh, and welcome to Art That Surrounds Us, a journey through the art collections of the Basilica of St. Mary in Minneapolis. Today I'm taking you on a behind the scenes tour of the fourth floor of the Basilica Rectory. Now we know the rectory as the Reardon Rectory because it was Monsignor Reardon who built the rectory. Now as you will remember, between 1922 and 1926, he did the interior of the church, all of it. The next year, 1927, he started building the sacristy and the rectory, which both were completed by 1928. The rectory on the first floor had offices and meeting rooms, second and third floor were living quarters for the priests and for the housekeepers, and then the fourth floor was a veritable attic. Now the rectory always had an elevator, but in 2012 the elevator was red tagged, which means that we could no longer use it, which means that the building was inaccessible. So we decided that we needed to build a new elevator. Now, for anybody who had used the old elevator, you'll remember how tiny it was and how scary it was to take that old elevator up into the second and third floor. Thanks to the Basilica Landmark, we were able to build a elevator tower that was attached to the rectory and in a similar style of the rectory. And the elevator is three times, four times, maybe five times as large uh, as the one that we used to have and it goes from the basement all the way to the fourth floor. So now the entire rectory, all five floors are accessible. Now the fourth floor, remember I mentioned it was an attic. When you would have come here before the year 2015, you would have found boxes and suitcases and records and all sorts of things that previous resident priests had left behind. So after cleaning it all out, we turned this into a new floor that was completely usable with offices and storage space for our art collections and for our archives. Come with me into the storage space for our art collections. 
So here we are in the storage space of our art collections. Now a number of things about this space. First of all, it is climate controlled for the security of our art collections. And also the fire suppressing system does not use water as opposed to all the other rooms in, in the building. The storage units are professional museum storage units. And so we have our two-dimensional art hanging on these racks that we can pull out. This, for instance, are some of the pieces for our Christmas exhibitions. So all the art that is rotated on exhibitions, um, when it's not on exhibition, ends up here in the safety of the art storage space. Each one of the creches, you know, it, this really makes a very good use of the, the, the little space we have. And so each one of the creches has its own drawer. And in these drawers, we have some foam that has a, a cutout for each one of the pieces of the nativity scenes. As you know, we also have a large collection of icons. As many of you know, we have a wonderful, wonderful collection of vestments as well. Many of them um, are made out of raw silk and are somewhat, um, somewhat fragile. Phyllis Lemberg is the artist who made most of our vestments. We probably have the largest collection of Phyllis Lemberg vestments in the country, in the world. Um, and so because they're fragile, we don't let them hang in the closets, but we actually fold them up very carefully uh, with, with acid-free paper and cloth. And so they rest here in this safe climate until we need them again. Um, the red vestments for Palm Sunday, for instance, are waiting here for the next Palm Sunday to come around. And we also have some of the antique vestments that we no longer use, but we want to keep them safe um, as for archival purposes and because they are really works of art. One of the other rooms on the fourth floor holds our archival collections. Now we are very, very lucky to have a large archival collection. Uh, Monsignor Reardon, um, as you know, the pastor who was here for more than 40 years, was a historian. So everything that happened in the parish during his 41 years of pastorate was recorded. We have record records from before, and of course we have more contemporary records as well. But we are really lucky to have all of these so that we can paste together the history of our parish. And here, for instance, you have all our sacramental records. So everybody who has been baptized, confirmed, got married, and even people who have passed away, all these records from dating back to 1868, which was the foundation of the Church of the Immaculate Conception, our predecessor, you can find here in the archives. And here we are in the last room we're visiting today. Um, it's our workroom. As you can see, it is a workroom. Lots of stuff around, many things being done from cataloging, because all of our artwork and all of our archival items are cataloged in a system that is called past perfect, which was developed for the Getty Museum um, and now so we're using that as well, which is a, a great system. It allows us to uh, describe the piece of art or the archival piece, um, what, what, what conservation situation is it, it is in, etc. And speaking of conservation, we just welcomed back two of our paintings that were restored at MIA. Um, one of them I will reveal unto you, which is actually the coronation of Mary as Queen of Heaven. Now the painting was really in bad disrepair. The paint was flaking um, and so everything has been stabilized and we have a beautiful new painting that now needs to go for framing and then will be returned to permanent exhibition. I also wanted to let you know that um, we have in our possession the original drawings by Emmanuel Masqueray and we'll give you a little peek at them. We won't talk much about them, we'll do a segment on Masqueray's drawing, but just to show you the wealth of material that we have here at the Basilica. So come with me. So here we have some of the original drawings that were done by Masqueray for the Basilica. You can see that they are, you know, for the interior stucco work and Emmanuel Masqueray is the architect. 
Um, this actually is the design for the dome. Um, as you can see, when you look up into the dome, there are four segments. It's a square dome, and each segment has one of the apostles in them. Although this is not the, the apostle that ended up there, this is actually Jesus. But um, uh, this is a general design for the interior of the dome. Um, important is that all of these were hand-drawn on linen. So today, of course, everything is done mechanically and um, generated by computers, but these are hand-drawn. We also have Slifer and Abramson designs. So when Masquerade passed away, Slifer and Abramson were his two of his associates, and they took over as the architects for the basilica. And everything in the basilica is actually drawn and uh, detailed for the basilica, including all the candlesticks and the crucifixes uh, were designed for the basilica. So this is actually a design for the choir stalls, you know, the wooden choir stalls that are in the apse of the church. Um, <laughs> so some more details. This is a detail for the drinking fountain. So if you're in the narthex of the basilica, you'll, you'll know that there are two large drinking fountains. They're no longer functional, but so this is the design for the drinking fountain. So again, everything that you see in the basilica was designed for the basilica. And finally, I want to show you one of our many vestments that are stored here in our workroom. Um, this is one of the gold vestments, which was for the Feast of the Sacred Heart. Um, this is a printout of or a document that helps us create the past perfect entry and as you see muslin to protect uh, the vestment and here you have the beautifully brocaded vestment used for the celebration of the feast of the sacred heart as you can see we have a wealth of art and archival items that we have here on the fourth floor in future renditions of art that surrounds us, we will talk more about individual pieces and collections. Until we meet again, let us continue to pray for one another. I was asked by Father Gill to come and do this webinar. I first met Father Gill during a re-envisioning process uh, for the Basilica campus. I was kept very busy pulling items from the archives for the architects who wanted to know everything about the history of the church, the history of the buildings, what was planned, what actually happened. Um, it was a wonderful experience. Um, and he said that your members might have two main concerns or interests that were archival related. Uh, the first would be um, advice for your clients, for churches who have archival materials but need guidance on what to do with them. And the second was what to do with your own personal and professional collections. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is retention. Um, archival materials are generally things that you want to keep forever uh, versus administrative records, which have a lifespan after which they are generally destroyed. Um, archival items to retain are things that tell the story of the parish and provide documentation of the important events in the life of that parish or church, um, annual reports, correspondence, parish leadership, minutes, any governance documents, scrapbooks, oral histories, photographs, uh, legal and HR files to a certain degree, uh, drawings. Our archdiocese has a records retention schedule, which has been very useful for me um, in my role as archivist and also sort of as a records retention manager. Um, and I would imagine that most denominations have some sort of guidelines as to how long they want things kept or if they want things kept forever. Just a few basics of good storage to keep in mind. Um, climate is very important, especially for anything paper oriented and also textiles. Um, you want a stable temperature and stable relative humidity. The ideal is around 70 degrees plus or minus a couple degrees and around 45% relative humidity. 
this is what we're able to provide here at the Basilica in our new space. Um, but understanding that um, that's not always something that's possible to do. Um, the next consideration is stability. So you want to guide people away from attics, from basements, from outside walls of a building, um, which are going to be affected by the change of temperature and humidity, especially during the change of seasons. So it's better to have a room that's probably a little too cold, maybe a little too dry, but at least stays the same because then you won't have the um, process of paper you know, absorbing water during high humidity and then letting that water go during the winter when it becomes very dry and stressing the fibers of the paper, which can ultimately cause it to break down. Light is pretty self-evident if you've ever seen a photograph that's been hung someplace where the sun is shining on it. Um, light is something else that will make those fibers break down and will fade photographs and drawings. You can obtain acid-free storage materials, boxes, sleeves, through a number of online merchants. Um, pretty easy to obtain and you don't have to go super fancy. Um, even a nice set of, of boxes, the um, kind of the office supply size boxes, is a good place to start. Reversibility is a key um, idea of preservation in the archives world. You never want to do something that you can't reverse. So you don't want to laminate that important document. You don't want to put glue all over the back of a photograph before you put it into that frame. You don't want to use a pen to mark across the back of a photograph because none of those things can be undone. There are, even 20 or 30 years ago, there were methods that were thought to be archivally sound, which now have been found to actually damage materials. So you always want to be sure you can undo anything that you've done to protect something. You want the space to be secure, probably limit the access. And if possible, and I know this is a big ask, you want to set aside more space than you presently need to store this archival collection. Um, because these collections always are growing as new things happen in the church, as new events go on, as new meetings take place. Um, as people hopefully are cleaning up their own attics and find something, some kind of precious treasure from the church's history and want to donate it. So if you can build in the space need to grow, that's wonderful. Um, that said, you'll also have, they'll also have to make choices. And in archives, often the content is more important than the vessel. So it's okay to copy and then throw out a news clipping that's brittle and breaking down. Um, it's okay to make a reproduction of a photograph that is flaking and disintegrating so that you have the information that's contained. That said, there are also things like um, the document we have, which is handwritten, elevating us to a minor basilica. That is something that will never be just copied and discarded because it's not only the information that's contained, but it's the object itself, which holds immense value to us. Sacramento records have kind of a special place, um, especially in the Catholic church, they are considered restricted records for 75 years. Um, baptismal records are actually legal records if um, you have a discrepancy with say your social security card and the name that you've been raised with, baptismal records are one of the legal documents that you can use to fix that. Can you put art and archives together? Yes, you can. Um, they have similar climatic needs and in a pinch, you can store them together. So I will be honest, after 20 years here, I am still trying to get everything cataloged. It is a long process. Um, it is a process that is organic to the institution. So here at the Basilica, I organized my manuscript collection based on the departments because that made the most sense 
to me and how things happen here. So my liturgy um, collection is, I know, a series of boxes and facilities and administration and development, but another place, another church may find it makes more sense to do it by date or by building, by pastor, um, whatever fits the collection and whatever fits how they need to access the information is fine. We use a rather fancy catalog database um, called Past Perfect, which was developed for the Getty Museum. It's a museum database that we've kind of jerry-rigged to work with the archives as well. And it's searchable. Um, but do you need this fancy online database? No, not necessarily. Um, before we had Past Perfect, we had a homegrown access database that did the job. Um, I've seen people use spreadsheets. I've worked at a county historical society that for their photographs actually made a copy of each photograph and then wrote the information below and put all that in binders so that people could just page through who were coming into research so they didn't have to handle the individual photographs. You can do a uh, just type of a box list and have that in a notebook. The important thing is that you document what you have and where you can find it again, which sounds simple, but is worth saying. So I'm gonna go through just a few of the most common types of objects that you'll have in an archival collection in a church or um, really any kind of institution. Photographs are wonderful records of what has happened. They're fun to exhibit. People love to see photographs. Um, you can store them flat or on edge as long as you give them support so they don't flop and bend. Um, you'll put similar sizes together. Um, and probably the best protection is to put each photograph into some sort of plastic sleeve of an inert plastic like mylar or polypropylene that doesn't have any off-gassing. Um, then here at the Basilica, what we do is we have a collection of the sleeved photographs and we put them into unbuffered paper folders kind of by topic and then into boxes and this provides protection both against any light getting in there and also if we were to have an incident with water um, that's a number of layers that the water would have to get to before it actually touched the photograph. And just to note that the, the box on the left is a donation I've received um, which is not in its proper housing yet, but it will be. Um, I wanted to use this to show that he was kind enough to mark down the event and the date of what the photographs were for. Uh, photographs are a more valuable resource if they are identified. So if you can identify what is happening and the date, people who are in the photograph, um, that's the best thing you can do. Um, you want to use a pencil. The archivally safe pens that are marketed are generally not. I would recommend pencil. Or you could include notes on a separate sheet of acid-free paper and put that with your photographs. Um, or use the binder method. For paper documents, which is going to be a huge part of what an archives has between committee records and correspondence, drawings, architectural work. You want to use a buffered paper enclosure. And these have um, a slightly alkaline buffer to them, which counteracts the natural acid in paper. Again, you want to protect them from water and light. And if you have old books, um, like we do, um, the book on the right is one of our announcement books where the priest wrote down the Sunday morning announcements of bands of marriage and who had passed away and events that were coming up um, when the when the Basilica Church was being built. They kind of wrote down milestones of what had happened. Um, this book is very fragile and the pages are not even really staying in the binding. So I had a volunteer who used to work at the Minneapolis Central <clears throat> Library 
special collections who taught me how to make these phase boxes, which is basically out of an acid-free board and you cut it to fit the book. So the flaps on the top and the bottom fold in and then you wrap the sleeve around and you have a tailor-made book size box um, that fits nicely on your shelf and protects the book. Um, for the textiles, we have all matter of textiles. We have uh, vestments, we have banners, we have liturgical items. Um, what you want to do with a textile is use an acid-free tissue for wrapping. And um, unbleached muslin is also another good material. And you can see in the gold vestment that the shoulder is kind of rolled over. That's actually muslin wrapped around a tube of the insulation that you can put over pipes. That's an inert plastic, which is also very inexpensive and a great thing to use when you're working with fabrics because you don't wanna have any folds. You always wanna roll so that you don't get any hard creases in the fabric or the textile, which is going to cause damage. So if you can store it flat, as we've done this vestment, that's ideal, but you may not have the room for the flat file cases like we do. So if you need to box, you always want to use that tissue to support the textile so it gently rolls. Um, another thing you can do is picture down below, we have one case in the workroom that's like this, where for our banners where you can roll them around a central holder um, so that there aren't any folds to cause damage. And the picture on the left is a Beretta of Monsignor Reardon's that I have in the archival vestment collection, wrapped in acid-free paper and it's stuffed, also filled out with the acid-free paper to help it keep its shape and protect it. Ephemera is the archival word for everything else. Um, so we have Christmas ornaments, we have stamps, we have badges from when they laid the cornerstone. Um, the bell is from the school, which the nuns used to ring to bring the children in in the mornings. Ephemera, you want to use kind of everything at your disposal um, acid-free boxes, dividers, acid-free tissue, whatever you need to provide the support to keep um, those objects stable. Um, the box on the side has trays that lift out so you can store a lot of things together. These kinds of items um, are often of more value for exhibits than for documentary information that they contain. Um, on the left, I have one of the weirder things in the archives, which is a foundation stone from a house that used to sit right to the north of the rectory. It was owned by a prominent parish family in the 1880s and 1890s. And when we put in a new garage, they found these foundation stones and I wanted one of these. So I have this rock in my archives and it's wrapped in plastic. Um, and sealed tightly to prevent any small living organisms that maybe had made a home on that rock from moving out into the archival collection. So once you've maybe made an effort to get your archives into safe containers that are gonna protect them, um, assessment is an important step. A number of um, churches and other organizations have made use with a volunteer committee to sort through the items that are there and also to determine what donations to accept if people start bringing things in that they want to give to the archives. It's really good to have somebody who knows the history of the church. They don't all have to look like these lovely ladies. Um, an art or an architecture background is also very helpful. You can also get a professional archivist to come in and assess. They can look at your space, your collection. Um, they do generally cost money. And I would say it's a good idea to establish even a very basic collection policy. We used to only collect items and keep items that were related to 
either the Basilica or the Immaculate Conception Parish. Um, but we changed that a few years ago to include the larger Minneapolis Catholic community when we realized that there weren't any other institutions collecting that kind of thing in Minneapolis and we didn't want to um, lose that bit of history. So um, that's kind of broadened our scope and I think made it a richer collection. So there's some additional resources to um, the diocesan archives, um, always good people to talk to uh, here in St. Paul, Minneapolis, our archivists and records folks, part of their job is to go out to churches and help them assess um, their archives, their collections, what they can do to take care of them better. Um, and that's a free resource for the churches. Uh, county and state historical societies also would be um, good resources to talk to about ideas for storage. Um, obviously, you can't put sacramental records or most administrative records into another collection, but say you have a beautiful large chair that was in your church that the bishop came and sat on, um, that there was hand carved by a prominent member of the parish. Sometimes you don't have the room or the capability to take good care of an object like that. It may be something of interest to another historical society so that you would know um, it was being preserved and also be able to be seen by other people outside of your church community. Um, here at the Basilica, we've made use of library science students serving as interns. They've helped us with a number of cataloging and housing projects. Um, there's also a library school at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and I'm sure many others in your own community. And then for online resources, the Minnesota Digital Library Project is funded by the Minnesota Legacy Grants, which if you're outside of the state, um, years ago we passed a constitutional amendment to set aside funding for art and history and environmental projects. The MDL is one of these that's funded that way. And they go out to all kinds of organizations, uh, not just churches, but schools and towns, um, social groups, rotary groups, and they will digitize records for free. The organization just provides the metadata and then it's posted up on their website where it's searchable. So we were able to digitize several of our announcement books that way, uh, some of our photographs and some of our drawings of the finish of the interior of our church. The Library of Congress services and programs page has a booklet on every kind of preservation or conservation question you might have and the Midwest Art Conservation Center, which is at MIA, the Minneapolis Institute of Art. Um, that's where we take our paintings and drawings for conservation work, and they provide um, webinars and classes and also um, assessment services for uh, more museum and conservation matters. So the second part is um, guidance for you, for your the consultants. Um, I think the essence of your work is that you do collect a lot of items that uh, have created your own kind of work professional archives. Uh, most of the guidelines for a church archives do apply to a personal collection in terms of proper housing, proper climate, um, ways that you can take care of things in your own collection. Um, when you're looking through and trying to decide if you want to, what you want to keep, as you look at the body of your work, um, I would consider the W's, where did it happen, obviously, but why and who made the decisions, when were these decisions made and what was the effect. You want to consider which records are particular to your work on the project and not duplicated maybe um, in architecture offices or with engineers, with the church administration. 
though I would recommend retaining duplicates if removal of those would create confusing holes within your collection. And I just wanted to touch on uh, digital files and digital media. Um, this isn't my strength, but if you are interested further, there are resources on that Library of Congress website, but also archivists who specialize particularly in digital records. Um, I'm guessing that nobody who's listening is still working in WordPerfect or saving to a floppy disk. Uh, technology changes and changes very quickly. And that means that access changes. I've got here three tapes that are in my archives collection, which are really no longer accessible because we don't have the equipment to play them. <laughs> um, SideQuest, the SideQuest disc, which is what we saved our magazine on in the early days, a DVD camera and a Betamax tape. Um, and 2008, that's not even that long ago. Um, so you, there are a few formats, JPEGs and TIFF files for images, PDFs have proven to be fairly stable and continue to be in use. But there are many others that are not any longer. You can migrate your data to um, an updated software or updated hardware, but that's time consuming. To be honest, for things like uh, parish council meetings, finance committees. Um, I save a lot of things on paper that really could were born digital and could stay digital just so that I know that they are going to stay <laughs> and be readable um, 10, 20, 50 years into the future. So it's just something to keep in mind as you're thinking about your own collection as to what is going to be accessible in the future and if there are things that are vitally important to a project that you think um, is information that should not be lost, then you might think about other ways that you can keep that information other than in a um, digital format. So I also heard that possible some of you are considering maybe donating your collections. You're looking at these boxes and boxes of materials in your house and thinking, I don't want to have these boxes in my house for the rest of my life. Um, so these are some basic guidelines if you are thinking about donating your collection of professional work to another institution. Uh, generally, archivists like things to be in its original order. Don't bother going through and alphabetizing or putting it chronological. Um, Part of the value in a collection is seeing how the person who created it put it together themselves at the time it was created. Um, I would say sometimes it's okay to weed through for any duplicates or if you have a final report and then a number of drafts going through and removing those drafts. Um, but there are some repositories that prefer to do all that work themselves. So if you are considering this option, I would talk with the people receiving the records before you do any hardcore weeding or cleaning out of your um, collection. It's good to provide some documentation, some notes, an overview of the projects that would help the archivist make sense of the collection. Um, boxes cost money. So it's a kindness if um, you are donating a collection to also make a financial contribution that would help pay for uh, rehousing and preserving and cataloging the materials. You want to look at the institution to make sure that they have good conditions, um, that their access rules are the same as what you envision for your collection. And also, does your collection augment others that are there? Um, because for researchers, it's very helpful if someone is doing research on a particular architect and you have a collection, a project that was on a church by that architect, if they're in the same place, that's very helpful to the researchers and it means that your information is going to be used and more accessible to them. So I'm going to leave you now with 
a photo of our infamous spider lights, which graced the Basilica from the late 1960s to the mid 1970s when an anonymous donor um, supposedly paid for them to be removed. Uh, please feel free to email me or call with questions and I will do my best. So thank you very much. Heather, thank you very much for the presentation. We'll now open up the webinar to questions and discussions. We do have one um, piece of feedback so far. Um, complete presentation. Uh, this is from Gilbert, uh, who you know. Uh, most younger churches are just starting to think, uh, are just beginning to think of starting archives. Any best guesstimate for how much space they should be looking to set aside? <laughs> um. So this is new churches just starting out. Yeah, I think like a younger church, um, you know, I don't know if that means a, a new church that might be building or a church that that is, you know, less uh, established and maybe has less um, things, but is looking are looking to set them up mm -hmm. in a way that's helpful for the future. So when Gilbert says by by young church, he means less than 50 years old. Okay. All right. Let me give you a little bit of guidance too. I actually have a client now that has an arts program and they're looking, um, we're doing some renovation work and they they are looking at making a climate controlled room mm -hmm. that they can actually store the artwork and they've determined a certain size and, um, and, and I looked at that size and thought it looked um, less than adequate. Okay. Um, I know when we were planning our space, um, what we did was measure each box and figure out all the shelving that we would need for that. And then we added on, I'm thinking maybe 25% more. I think we should have gone much larger than that. When the archdiocese moved their archives, they actually not only mapped out, measured each box, but they mapped out exactly where on which shelves it was gonna go in their new space, which is an amazing effort so that they were able to know, you know precisely where they would have an extra foot of space or a narrow place that they could you know, put a few large paintings, something like that. So I, I guess I, the advice that I would give is um, never plan exactly what you need at the moment because that's immediately gonna change probably before the space is completed. I think your instinct was probably right that they weren't making allowance for enough space, um, given that the collection is going to continue to grow. Um, but if they're really just starting, I would say, you know, even a dedicated shelf or a dedicated closet, something where they can keep the most precious things together is a place to start. It really, it depends so much on what they have and um, how much they've already collected. So maybe this is a follow-up uh, question too. I know the the um, committee that at this church that was working on storing their artwork, um, we're, we're pretty um, resourceful uh, people and found um, storage uh, ideas and um, storage um, examples i don't know if that came from other churches or from online resources are there are there um online resources for for instance storage cabinets or you know do you pick up storage boxes just at regular uh office supply doesn't seem like that would be the case um where where are the best resources for both furniture or shelving or things that might be most useful and and then for the things that I mean I wouldn't know I guess where to begin looking for um, the right plastic to to put photographs in. Sure, um, we use uh, Gaylord, which is an online vendor um, that is not just um, boxes and sleeves and that sort of thing, but they also have a division that's furnishings. Um, I think when we did our archival space, we went through a vendor named Montel, which makes those movable shelves. Um, 
but really any kind of metal shelving, if you would stay away from wooden shelving, but any metal shelving is going to work for a basic archives um, or metal uh, flat files like you use for maps and drawings. So those kinds of things you could get at a regular office supply store, those basic furnishings. And it's possible Office Max, they may have the acid-free boards, uh, acid-free boxes. Um, but otherwise, I'd say Gaylord, there's also a company called University Products that has uh, it's very reputable. Um, it used to be a company called Light Impressions, which actually was sold and I wouldn't recommend anymore. But we used to get a lot of things through Light Impressions. Online, it's really your best source. I think, um, I don't know if the store, if archivers, if they're still even around. Um, but my impression was that they were pretty expensive, <laughs> the ones, the stores that you could walk into, um, and that they were geared more towards um, genealogists and um, people with little fam small family collect collections who um, were willing to spend a little bit more money and didn't need things in bulk. So we do have a question from one of our um, members that's asking about the artwork that you have stored in the archives. Does that artwork then routinely get um, taken out and displayed um, in the church or are there um, lending, is there lending that happens? Are they rotated? Are some of them um, fragile enough or delicate enough that that's not possible? <laughs> um Yes, <laughs> to all those things. Um, we do rotate some of the artwork out, especially our um, crushes normally. Um, Johan and Kathy, would, our sacred arts coordinator, would be starting to prepare for the annual crush exhibit. Um, we're coming up, finishing up the uh, month of our icon, annual icon exhibit. So a number of things in the collection do rotate into display and then back into storage. Um, we do have some permanent art that's up in the Undercroft and in the rectory office building and in the church. Um, and I think that there are also some items that are simply too fragile at this point to put on display. So um, that work is actually taken care of by um, Kathy Damers, who's our that coordinator of sacred arts. Um, she also is involved in loaning out some objects. Um, she was just telling me yesterday, I believe St. Thomas is possibly borrowing a few of our pieces. Um, and that's tracked in our database so that we know when objects go out and when they come back in. So kind of in, in uh, conjunction with that, and, and I thought about this the other day when we were doing the practice because it, it well, it, it dawned on me a little bit because of just things like uh, having a collection of VHS tapes that I no longer am able to play. <laughs> I, get, I get how technology changes. But are there, um, do you do some photographing of records or um, of photographs so that they can be more easily loaned on a short-term basis or accessed by members or parishioners, or is it just too uh, time consuming to really do that, that there isn't an effort to to put anything on in a digital format that might increase the availability of use. So um, Kathy has started doing um, work with digital, a digital exhibit on the website of some of our artwork. And I'm hoping to do some of that with the archival displays that we've done over the last couple of years as well. So we are digitizing um, a number of photographs. We've got some drawings that are all digital, which has made it easier to loan them out for people to see anyway. I don't know about for people to use um, in an exhibit that the digitization is that, that is that good. Um, but that's more of a, I guess for most objects, that's more of a backup record than sure. 
but it does definitely make the access easier. Um, it's yeah, one of the I things I like. Especially things like art that maybe are too fragile to take out, you still want to be able to use as an educational tool or something to inspire people in a different way, even if they can't um, have access to that original piece. Or with photographs that, you know, it's obviously very easy to share digital material and you don't have to worry about a fingerprint or damage mm -hmm. uh, because he didn't store it correctly or had even got damaged in transit, something like that. I think now um, <laughs> during these times, we're thinking more and more about what we can do with digital access. Um, it's something that has been discussed for a long time, but now it's something that we have to do because it, in a lot of ways, it's our only way to reach out to people with the art and the archives collection. Well, Heather, that's all the time we have today, um, but I really want to thank you um, for, for the work that you do and for uh, sharing um, insight as to how our members, whether artists or consultants or architects, can access records and also um, preserve our own treasures for the future. And Heather, again, Thank you so much for your insight and for agreeing to share your wisdom with us. Well, thanks for the opportunity. I really enjoyed it.